All right. I've got a brand new guest for y'all today. And on today's episode, alongside co-host Bianca Leger, we interview a father, a husband, a one yoga teacher working out of One Yoga North Vancouver, who's been walking the yoga path for over 15 years as a student, as a practitioner, and as a teacher. Welcome to the Winner Circle, Peter Elmas. Amazing. Um, stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. Mm. We're stoked to have we're so, you. We're stoked to have you. And Bianca and I have been had the pleasure of taking your classes on the One Yoga Digital community um, mm -hmm. this past 40 days for a 40-day challenge. And even prior to that, I did a few other challenges with you. So I'm excited to get to know you more. The goal with this podcast is really to uplift, inspire, and empower our listeners to move forward on their hero's journeys with greater faith and belief in themselves. And so we like to keep this pretty light and very positive. And that first question is as such. And that first question for you, Peter, is what do you love about your world right now? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, and I think really important that we, we connect to on the regular, like the, the good things, the positive things, the things we love. Um, I mean, I, I feel really blessed um, overall. I am in a beautiful part of the world. I live in North Vancouver at the base of a mountain, right by the water, um, with uh, amazing family. My, my partner, my wife, Cecily, is super supportive and um, strong, doesn't let me get away with stuff and, and, and holds me to it. And then I've got, we've got two wonderful kids um, that uh, are such a trip. Um, I would even I could go on and on about how much I love having them. I got we got a dog. I mean, obviously, I mean, like everyone else, apparently, um, we ended up with this amazing dog that I get to run in the forest with every day. So, um, and then the work I do, um, which you guys have experienced, just the opportunity to to um, yeah hold space for people for their journeys, um, their healing, their discovery, their realizations, their their medicine. Yeah, so. Um, I mean, a lot, I, there's a lot that I'm very grateful for and in love with these days. Mm -hmm. So one way that we get to know our guests, um, and I think it's a very important question that listeners should ask themselves. And it's something that's always changing, but right here, right now, Peter, what is your current mission here in this reality plane that expands beyond your professional, your personal, it incorporates at all, your personal mission here on earth? Yeah, it's a, I mean, again, I think a really important question. Um, I start all of my the classes I lead, the practice I lead with with um, getting people to set intentions and, and encourage them to show up um, on purpose with purpose. I think it's so important um, to have that set, and to have those missions, and to have um, you mean something that you're aiming at. Me personally. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, like professionally, I mean, and I think there's a few different ways that I, I mean, would answer it, but professionally, at least, um, I wrote this last week and um, was sent it, there was a postcard that got sent back to me from a retreat that we did, which is amazing. Um, but it said, what I'd written was, go deep, fly high, report back. Mm. So I think... I'm in a unique position to be able to um, do some of this deeper work and, and sort of explore some of those heights. Um, I mean, my life, is, my journey has led me to um, this really unique position. And I really feel strongly about coming back and sharing those experiences and, and, and helping others have similar ones. Um, and I mean, walking people home, right? Mm -hmm. we'll bring, bring Ram Dass right into it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're all just walking each other home. And if I can um, yeah, help a few others on that journey, then I'm feeling really lucky. And then, I mean, the other mission, I mean, the very central to my life is my role as a father and as a, a husband. Mm -hmm. um, and part of my, my personal mission is to just get better at doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and while I think I'm doing all right, and um, there's still a lot of work to be done. So that's certainly central for me. Mm. Being a parent is, I mean, I can only like look up to it because I haven't experienced it, but it, it does seem like you said, like a trip in itself to be there and support and guide 
the little beings on their process is intense. And then the fact that you do that on the mat as well for groups of people who are also looking at you for guidance is, is really um, admirable. I think it's something to celebrate and to acknowledge. And because I've, I've taken some of your classes at this point, and they stand out, they do, your energy is really beautiful. And it, every time I took one of your classes, it, it connected it to my got me to connect with my breath in a way that was um, more healing than I than we often make yoga classes to be um, in what they what what is accessible to everybody I just wanted to share that yeah. thank you Bianca that's awesome yeah I love um, hearing that kind of feedback because that's I mean that's all I'm I'm trying to do right is, is hold space and, 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 and help others connect to their I mean innate built-in hardwired ability to, to self-regulate and to get grounded and present and clear and heal and yeah and then you I mean evolve which is sort of mm -hmm. what we're doing right mm -hmm. right so let's take a let's take a look back at how this journey to yoga how this yogi's path begun what brought you to yoga what did that look like peter yeah okay good question um i mean there, there's a few different versions of this story and I'll try and, I'll try and keep it concise. I think it was, um, I mean, I, I, I really believe that where I am right now is perfect, like exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, and, and everything I need is right here. And that means that everything that, that got me here was also perfect and necessary and, and a part of it. So, I mean, I think it goes back beyond even an awareness of what yoga was. Um, I think I'm, I mean, sort of, my personality and, and my constitution are very much um, very, I'm very well suited for this type of work, right? It, it, a lot of it came pretty naturally. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm generally kind of slow and deliberate um, and internal. I mean, I, I've got a pretty rich internal environment um, and I'm comfortable in there. Um, so it, it made a lot of this stuff really easy. And I attribute that to a lot of things growing up. Um, I was really, really loved, um, really blessed all the way through. Like I, I didn't have a dad in the house, um, which was probably the only advantage I didn't have growing up. Um, and that had an impact obviously, but um, yeah, my mom was just pure unconditional love um, and that, so my heart was always full. Um, I grew up, I mean, I'll try not to go on too many tangents, but I grew up in the Roman Catholic church Right? And there was some stuff, right, as there is within the Roman Catholic Church that, that had my mom sort of like keep us, like pull us from Sunday mass kind of stuff. Um, but what it did was sort of familiarize me with the idea that there was more, right? We're not these separate individual meat sacks just sort of fumbling around. Like there's, there's something, there's source, there's spirit, there's, right, there's a way. Um, and so I sort of set that way. And then, um, and I was also very physical. Like I grew up in, as an athlete, I, I, I played basketball and soccer at a pretty high level. Um, so definitely embodied as well. And I got to about 19 or 20 and everyone was going off to university. And I had some older friends and I watched them take their, you know, I mean, their student loans and blow it on a stereo system and lots of drugs and booze and yeah. party with me while they're supposed to be in school. Um, and so I realized that not knowing exactly what I wanted to study and not wanting to go into debt um, that it wasn't quite right for me and the scholarships kind of fell through to the state for support. Um, so I, I mean, I got called to travel um, and I luckily had this space in my life and I, I, I took off. I spent most of my 20s um, living out of a backpack, traveling all over the world. Yeah. Um, and as I sort of, I mean, Central America and then eventually sort of Turkey, where I mean, my father's from, so the heritage there, um, I sort of got these sort of glints of, of meditation and spirituality that were kept popping up. Um, and again, being drawn to it, I always thought, I mean, grew up, um, I mentioned sort of Star Wars and, and, and wrestling and, and comic books, but also on like Kung Fu movies and, and Bruce Lee and I always thought that my, my, my physical spirituality would be a more aligned like a martial art. I was like, had my I had an experience with Tai Chi and 
um, was looking for the Kung Fu master to pop up in my travels. But what ended up happening is I made a, like a third trip to Mexico um, and had some really incredible experiences. Um, I was in a spot in Oaxaca called San Jose del Pacifico, um, mm -hmm. which is renowned for its mushroom, magic mushroom. Um, it's kind of where you go for your trip and it, it's part of their culture. Um, so I had wonderful experiences there. Um, sort of contrasted with, I was going back from Mexico City to these mountain, this mountain range in the beach. They're really heavy and dark and then as light as you can get um, mm -hmm. and hanging out with this group like elves in the mountains, but then like street hustlers in Mexico City. So it was a really intense experience. Yeah. Um, and you know what I mean, ended up like I used the curb in Mexico City as a pillow a couple nights. Um, and it really like, really some really deep, profound experiences, um, but kind of laid me low. So I ended up retreating back to Ottawa where I'm from, um, sort of onto, a, onto a, a buddy's couch with a big <laughs> bag of, big bag of weed and a lot of takeout, right? And I'm about 23, maybe 24. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of mine found out, an acquaintance found out that where I'd been in Mexico, and I told him stories of, yeah, there's, there's tons of land and there's some great locals and they're willing to split off a corner if you sort of help them out and you can build whatever you want. And that sounded great to him. So he's like, okay, he just refurbished a VW bus. He's like, we're going to drive across Canada from Ottawa down the West Coast to Mexico, like go on this epic road trip. And I want you to show me all these spots. And he had some money. Like I'm, I'll buy something and we'll set something up. I'm like, cool, that of course. I mean, I was, I had nothing. Like I was just sort of hanging out at that point. But he's like, we're gonna wake up every morning and practice yoga. Mm. Um, he was a yogi, and, and I'd never, I'd never been in any kind of yoga practice. Um, but he's like, no, we're gonna get up every morning first thing. We're gonna do our yoga practice. It's gonna be part of what we're doing. Um, his girlfriend has just opened a yoga studio around the corner in the neighborhood. And he had some work that he needed done in his backyard. Um, so he's like, you dig this hole with me, you redo my fence, and then you can use my girlfriend's yoga studio for free. Oh. And then, I mean, a few months from now, we're gonna take off. That was a pretty sweet deal. I mean, the way I was living. Um, so I went, did the work in his yard, and the next day I went to my first yoga class, not knowing like anything. Um, I'd smoked cigarettes for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like I was like a half a pack at least a day. You know what I mean? And if I was out, I mean, a pack or two. Mm -hmm. um, went into the class with half a pack of cigarettes in my, in my bag. And we did this 75 minute um, vinyasa practice. Like really simple, like ujjayi breath, movement within the breath, um, pretty challenging. Shavasana, the whole trip. Um, I haven't smoked cigarettes since. I walked out of that class and threw the pack of cigarettes away. Oh. Um, it was, I mean, quitting smoking, and I know it's really challenging for a lot of people. It was one of the easiest things I've ever done. Um, and, it, and it was fascinating to me. Um, she taught me how to, you know, I mean, we use, like often cigarettes are used for like self-regulation and, and sort of mm -hmm. deal with our emotions or, or, or what's going on around us. Or, um, and when she tapped me into my breath, and the urge to smoke was gone. I mean, and I had no intention to smoke, uh, of quitting, but it was just gone. So right away, right? They say some students are, you know, I mean, wet, mossy undergrowth and you put the fire to it and it takes a while to sort of heat up and smolder and catch fire. And, 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 do, and some students are like gunpowder, right? You put, the, <laughs> you put the fire to it and there you go. Yeah. And I was sort of definitely closer to gunpowder. So right away, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is where it's at. Um, there's something really incredible here. And I had access to the studio for free. Um, so I started going like morning and night. I was going as much as I was going every day, um, morning and night if I could. Um, and I mean, pretty quickly, like a lot of transformation really quickly. Um, the idea that maybe we don't have to eat meat was introduced, like a himsa, maybe yogis are vegetarians. It wasn't, I mean, we pushed on me, but I was like, okay. I try that. I'd eaten meat every day for mm. my whole life, if not twice a day. No intention of being vegetarian, but I tried it. I could try it a month, see what happens, and I felt great. 
It's like, oh, okay, got it. So like, it was just one thing after another. And then a month later, I met my buddy on the street and he'd just come back from the ashram in a yoga retreat. And he said, you want to go to India instead? And I said, yeah, of course I do. Oh, so a month later, yeah, a month later we were in India. Oh, and my. again, just like boom, 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 one after another, um, I was bathing in the Ganges um, up in Rishikesh, um, having you know, the trippiest time. So, I mean, it was just um, exactly what I needed at exactly the right time. And I ran with it. Yeah. Wow. Um, relatable moment for me is the couch surfing in Ottawa because <laughs> I live right by there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely a thing <laughs> relatable um but oh my god I my curiosity I would love to hear about those trips to India how was that it, yeah <laughs> I'm super interested yeah I mean I am um, it's funny like my dad um he went around and and just before we left he's like dude why are you going to India and I said, I mean, I'm this yoga, this, this yoga stuff is, is lighting me up. And this is where it comes from. And this is the source of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I want to get it, right? I, like, I think it, it, it's important to, I mean, if, yeah, you learn from the best, like you seek out the, the mm -hmm. ones that are doing it really well and, 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 um, and, and soak it up. So I was like, yeah, of course I'm going to go to source. Um, so I've actually, I went, ended up going twice. Um, there for six months each time. So I spent about a year in India. Um, and the first stop was Rishikesh, which is one of the, I mean, one of their, their holiest cities. Um, mm -hmm. It's up north um, at the base of the Himalayas, kind of where the Ganges comes out, one of the first little towns that the Ganges meet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just covered in... Um, sadhus and holy people and ashrams and spiritual seekers um, everywhere you turn like you're just I mean it's smacking you in the face so a really intense immersive experience that again that just sort of quickened um, the whole process mm. um, really lucky like my at that point I was a pretty seasoned traveler um, mm. and I mean, I look in the way I look, um, I can, you mean, I, I can pass for, you know, I mean, local-ish, most, a lot of places I go, I'm also a pretty big guy, so I, I was, I felt pretty safe going, traveling around, um, which was important, I could, I could sort of stay easy, um, but yeah, the ashrams in Rishikesh were pretty incredible, um, I did a couple of retreats up there, um, and and you meet I don't know have either of you read the autobiography of a yogi? I haven't. Sarah I Mahanda, know the book, Mahanda. but yeah, not yet. Well, um, my first teacher gave me that book on my way to India, and I read it on the plane. Um, and as I got there, and it's filled with stories of, of great yogis and, mm -hmm. and 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 miracles and and, and things that the, the the powers that yogis end up with. And almost right away, I met a dude. A dude, um, Sadhu, mm -hmm. um, and he was older. Like he told me about his life, and and he watched Shakti like he had a full career, um, family, grandkids. So he must have been seventies. Like he was older, but like spry, full head of dark hair. Um, and the story, the story that was told to me about him was that um, he didn't eat. He had a glass of milk every day. That was it. Mm. And once a year, he would walk from Rishikesh down to the southernmost most tip of India, which is a big walk um, for the Shiva festival, um, and then journey back. And so he just walked all the time. And I got within about um, 10 feet of him. And his energy was palpable. Like it was the first time... I got like the off, off somebody. And you, you just step into that field and um, I mean, it's just, it's transformative, the experience. I got to spend a day like walking around the foothills with him. Um, 
I'd almost convince myself to walk with him. Um, it takes about three months of walking. He just gets up in the morning and walks wherever he is when the sun goes down. He finds a tree and falls asleep under it. Wow. Um, and I came, I came this close to going with him. Um, I'm not sure it would have went well for me, but um, so I mean, I so I had a bunch of these encounters with some really phenomenal, um, magical beings, mm -hmm. um, and then from the north ended up going down to Southern Goa um, for a while. So some of the most beautiful beaches you'll find anywhere in the world and had a very, I mean, different experience as far as climate, but continued to meet these incredible yogis and yoga teachers and um, people that became mentors. I discovered Reiki on that mm -hmm. first trip. I don't know if either of you have much experience with it, um, but that really tuned me into the, the subtle bodies and the, the chakras and the nadis and, and got me working with them directly like my own and others that was an amazing education um and did a few little jaunts we ended up in hampi which is um, a pretty holy place and then down south to kerala as well um and then so that was the first trip so lots of yoga lots of reiki um and then left and spent another year and a half in, the, in Europe and then went back again um, to India a second time with the intention of like really focusing on my yoga training. So the second trip, I spent three months at this one particular ashram um, outside Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Um, it was part of the Shivananda School of Yoga. Um, so a, a sort of long established lineage, um, a pretty beautiful Environment, you know, I mean, the Shivananda organization has, has, has lots of issues, like a lot of these lineages do. Um, but my time there in this sort of new rural ashram with Swami Govindananda um, was um, really important. I had a month of, of pretty chilled ashram life, um, lots of time with him and his staff. And then we did this intensive course where 60 people from all over the world came in for a month and we just like 24 seven yoga. It was, it was, um, the course was designed, what, what the founder designed the course to do was to create peace bombs hmm. um, that he was then gonna let out into the world to explode peace all over the place. So it really did after that month, you know, I mean, my ears were ringing with mantra and my heart was filled with just love. And, um, hmm. and I got to stay for another month after that. and, and and really deepen those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, it was, it was pretty clear after that, that this was, this was it. Mm -hmm. and this, this, was, this was the calling, this was um, what I needed. This was my medicine. This mm -hmm. got, me, got me connected and, and filled up and um, straight and I saw, I mean, it, it was so amazing to see the transformation of other people right around me um, and how profound the simplest things can be when delivered um, well. So, you know what I mean, started teaching pretty quickly after that. And wow. um, yeah, it just kept, like yoga just keeps, keeps getting me higher and higher and higher. <laughs> so, one thing I'm very curious about is where was the resistance along this path? It, it, from your um, tale that you just told us, it didn't appear that there was much. Um, from when you decided not to go to university despite all your friends doing that, to deciding to travel around the world, to your friends, hey, why don't we go to India? Yeah, sure. And then um, all, all these journeys, um, it, it seems like you just said yes to it all. So let's talk about whether resistance arose. And if not, um, where does resistance arise in your life? And how do you overcome that? Oh, yeah. We'll go with the first one and build up to the second question. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think, and it, it, it actually occurred to me, um, I mean, the idea of being of service um, has always been um, there for me. I always, I mean, I was the guy in the team that made the others better. Like I, I like to lead from behind and fill the gaps and, um, and adapt and adjust that way. And I mean, so 
the vein of service is pretty clear and, and flirted with the, I mean, briefly with the idea of becoming a priest, right? Towards the, I mean, 17, 18. Also flirted with the idea of, of joining the army. That was a whole, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same stuff, like being a service. So as, you know I mean, as I'm having these experiences in India, part of me is feeling the call to like renounce worldly life um, and uh, put on some robes and, you know I mean, find myself in an ashram or find a cave or, you know I mean, just dive deep into that. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, um, I was constantly in relationship. So being called to um, have a partner um, and, and, and work through that kind of energy. So actually the first time I met Swami Govindananda, which was the first trip to India, my question for him, like I had some time with him, my question was, like, what do I do? Um, I'm in this relationship, but I also want to just follow you around and, and wait for you to give me an orange robe and you change my name and, and, and let's do this. Let's, let's, let's get it as high as possible. Um, and what he said, so that was, I mean, that was my sort of battle was between that worldly life and, and that spirit trip. And what he said to me at the time, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, I'm like, well, that's not helpful. Um, but I've since come to appreciate, he said, you're in a relationship now, just be in that relationship. And I was like, well, all right. Thanks. That's not really, I mean, tell me what to do. Like, just tell me to keep doing it. But since then, it's like, no, I mean, be where you are. Right? Like, don't, don't, don't reach for something else. Don't try and create something. Like, like don't overreach or buck what's going on right now. Like, just drop into where you are and do it fully. And if it's in a relationship, great. Be in a relationship. If it's, if it's not, then okay. Then, then, then you're not. So that, I've played with that over the years, but that was certainly um, maybe the main, one of the main threads that, that still, I mean, it was only relatively recently that I realized that I kind of needed to actively change my story mm. um, and let go of that other stuff that was holding me back a little bit in my worldly life, I think. Um, so that's always been my, my sort of internal battle. Mm-hmm. And where the result comes from. What was that stuff? What was that stuff you refer you're referring to that you let go of, and how did you let go of it? Well, I, so I mean, where I am now, um, I mean, after that second trip to India, I kept traveling. Um, there was I mean, more relationships, um, and and but I was I was pretty free, right? And and at any time. I, I could hit back, you know, like go back to the ashram and drop everything and, and renounce from the uh, in the sadhu. Um, and then there was a point in, in the trip, maybe around 30, where sort of my plan fell through. I'd gone back to Ottawa, was teaching there. I was helping to run a, a friend's yoga studio. And my plan had been to go to Costa Rica. Um, my plan fell through, like the other plans fell through. So like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to this intentional spiritual community in Costa Rica, looks incredible. I'm gonna go hang out there for a while. Um, and my sister was in Whistler um, managing the Lululemon store. This is 2010, mm-hmm. 2010. So okay. the Olympics were about to, to, to start in Whistler in Vancouver. And she, her store like quadrupled in size. Suddenly they renovated, like they moved and renovated. And she had this massive store. She didn't know what she was doing. Um, that's not true. She knew exactly what she was doing, but um, <laughs> said, come to Whistler, teach yoga, um, work for me in the store and just be here for the Olympics. Like you can go to Costa Rica after. So I said, sure, of course, like live with me and come stay here. And so I said, sure. And got there in December. Olympics were starting, I guess, February. Um, still, you know, all the options open. And at the same time, what she'd also done was, like, I guess, ask Lululemon for help, like some managerial help. So Lululemon had this, um, I, I guess they might have had a few, but um, they sent her an elite manager. So someone that was, you know, had been managing stores for years and had been in California opening stores. This was someone who was going to sort of help her manage her and manage the store with her. 
Um, and the first, this manager's first day, I came in from my shift and went into the back room where they're all meeting. And I walked in the door and there on the floor was the brightest, most radiant smile and eyes I'd ever seen. Um, and just fell instantly and magically in love. Like it was like, uh oh, kind of like, here we are, this is it. Um, and, and different than other, other encounters. And I'm pretty sure she felt the same way, right? Mm -hmm. This was the manager that they called up. Um, and, uh, and 11 months later, we had a son. <laughs> Yeah, like it was just, it was meant to be, it was magical, it was quick. Um, and so I went from living out of a backpack to having a mortgage in like six months kind of thing and, and, and being a real householder, mm -hmm. right? Having this, this really important relationship um, that is still magical um, to this day um, and having a, a son um, and having all these worldly duties. Um, and then we had it, and the next, a year and a half later, we had our daughter, um, so Bodhi and Luna, my wife named Cecily, who you guys have also practiced with, um, mm -hmm. the one yoga teacher, um, I mean, I could talk about her for the whole hour. Um, <laughs> but so suddenly, and I, I bought in, like the moment she's like, I'm pregnant, I'm like, got it, I'm here, let's do this. Um, but what lingered was this story that, you I mean, I was could be or would be or destined to be an aesthetic, uh, a renunciate, a sadhu or a monk. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it was kind of like one foot out, like not, I wasn't, it was never, it was never something that was conscious. I was never like, I'm, I'm one foot out the door, like that wasn't it, but unconsciously, subconsciously, and I encountered it over the years, um, there was that dissonance and that resistance. Mm. Um, and, and sort of that option was still like there and I, I hadn't cleared it. I hadn't come to terms with it and cleared it, um, which I think was important for me. Um, so through a lot of different sort of personal development work, I realized that that was what was in the way a lot. Mm. Um, and once I was able to be in the relationship, I was in a relationship and just be in it without thoughts of alternatives or other paths or and I'm a Gemini so it's really hard to do right like I, I definitely contain multitudes mm -hmm. um so to, to to really bring all of my um heart and soul right into where I was um and into the commitment I'd made um was a really powerful thing mm -hmm. um and a big step in in me growing up I think and, mm -hmm. and maturing and, yeah so that, I mean, that's, that's the realm of the resistance, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So what was that work um, that you did to help you get both feet into the now when one was somewhere else? You, you know, a, a big turning point, And I mean, if, if you know anything about Lululemon, I ended up working for them for you mean, nine, nine, 10 months. Um, it, it got me down to Vancouver. Um, and actually was what got me connected to Ryan and One Yoga, but um, they send all their employees after about nine months to Landmark Forum. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with Landmark. A little bit. You could explain to it to us. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, it, it, um, it's sort of that like stereotypical, intense, um, self-help, immersive weekend seminar where okay. they like throw you, it, 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 like think about like Tony Robbins, um, okay. like big energy big room yeah like straight shots into your heart and soul and um, all your resistance and all your stories and just like pulling people apart and building them back up really intense experience um that a lot of people don't enjoy um and and so there's you I mean you're either gonna like either people will love landmark or think it's a cult um or at least at the very least like a, a <laughs> pyramid scheme um and i resisted i resisted landmark I'd heard these stories and I know it like I'm like I'm I got yoga like I'm doing that work I'm doing the self-discovery work I'm doing the, the spiritual work I don't I'm gonna focus here um and I'm like I don't need to do it and so I didn't and it took a few years and once you've done it um it definitely has a profound effect changes the, your language a little bit um 
And it becomes difficult, it can be difficult to relate intimately to people that haven't done that depth of work. Mm -hmm. I think that was kind of the impetus from my sister again and um, Cecily, my partner. Um, they continually kept saying, you should really should do Landmark. You really need to do Landmark. Um, so a few years later, I, I caved and went and did Landmark. And what I realized immediately was that I was not doing that kind of work. Um, it was very different um, and really important for me to do. Like it really shows you your story mm -hmm. um, and where they come from. They do a wonderful job of um, taking you back into your, uh, along your path to show you these seminal moments in your life where mm -hmm. something happened and you made meaning out of it. So mm -hmm. it conflated the two things and it's, it's been the foundation of everything that's come after. And usually it's sort of a traumatic kind of thing. And they do a wonderful job of unfolding that, of mm -hmm. taking the meaning off the event and letting you get sort of free from some of that energy. And I mm -hmm. watch people have like radical physical transformation in an afternoon because they released so much stuff um, or got so free and clear. So really powerful. So it was through that process. I mean, I wasn't, I think if you're not doing that work at all, it can be in super intense. Um, I had been doing that work, so I was pretty comfortable there, but it was definitely where I started to look at my stories and what was behind the way I was occurring um, in every aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. um, like a real, um, yeah, real personal inquiry um, that sort of showed me, yeah, showed me where I was resisting life and where I was res resisting what, what is and, and, and what needed to be um, mm -hmm. and freed, freed me up to, to, to jump in even deeper to where I was. So that was, I, I think Landmark was a, a big part of that um, realization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Landmark was a big helper for you on your journey. Um, mm -hmm. you mentioned a few others, um, Ram Dawes, your wife, your partner, Cecily, and many yeah. more. Um, so let's just take a moment to acknowledge other than Landmark, um, who are some of those people that have left a great influence on your being? Mm -hmm. Who were they? And what were your prime takeaways? What were your prime lessons that you took from that, that you've incorporated into who you are? Got it. Um, yeah, let's, let's start with Seth, Cecily, she, um, she is one of the most direct people I've ever met. Um, and, um, just watching the way she occurs in the world and operates was, was really interesting to me, like how she speaks her truth and. Um, doesn't compromise and, and, and act powerfully when compelled. Um, those were, were definitely big things for me. So she continues to be um, one of my greatest guides and teachers. Um, Ryan Lear, um, who I know you both have, have, have big soft spots for, um, has been really important in, in my journey, especially the past eight years. Um, when I met him, what I saw was someone that was ahead of me on the path, right? Same, same, like basketball player, father, like big heart, um, big beard. Um, and he was just that few, like whatever, how many steps ahead. And he created this incredible um, vehicle uh, that we know as one yoga that wasn't just like, isn't just super cool, right? It's just like, I mean, he's a super rad, cool guy, but it was really heart-centered and um, compassionate and inclusive um, and inspiring. Um, he continues to inspire. So from him and from one yoga, like he gave us the oneness mantra, right? I don't know how familiar y'all are with it. I'm sure you've heard it. Um, mm -hmm. Practice courage, grow roots, fly high, truth is we are one so that gave me a great framework right off the bat the courage piece was really interesting for me um i think i mean there's a great osho quote about courage coming first mm -hmm. you can't do anything w without being courageous um that lion-hearted um courageous approach i, I mean i definitely 
got from Ryan or, or just sort of the, the importance of it or the power of it mm -hmm. um, and what's possible out in the world when you're aligned with it. That was really big for me and it continues to be um, to the point that I like, I actually tattooed the one yoga lion on, on my heart. I've got my own little lion heart I walk around with. Um, so Ryan's been key in the whole one yoga community, right? It's a collection of some of the greatest yoga teachers I've come across and some of the most wonderful yogis and, and, and practitioners and, and friends um, and, and the benefits from being in that stream with, with all of them is, is, I mean, I can't even begin to speak to. Um, so that's ongoing and been really seminal. But then, I mean, you mentioned um, the man himself, like Ramda, um, and he, I was, the friend who was, I went to India with, who introduced me to yoga, also gifted me um, my first copy of Be Here Now. Um, I'm holding it up, even though no one's going to be able to see it, but I wanted you to see it. Um, and I said first copy, because this, the one I'm holding is probably like my 30th. I just keep giving it away. <laughs> because it made such an incredible impact on me. Um, the book itself, um, the stories in it, the art that is like the middle section. And then in the back is like the perfect guide to yoga. Like he calls it a, spirit, it's a, it's a spiritual cookbook. Um, and so I think it's such an important, it's been such an important book for me, which led me to all of his other work, um, which I have, I've devoured, um, everything he's done and has been a really important guide to me. And I think so many others, um, I think I would imagine that a lot of your listeners will be able to relate to my love for Ram Dass. He, it was really cool to see the, an example of a Western intellectual mind get his heart blown open um, and where it led him, mm -hmm. right? Um, he, I mean, his story is incredible. Um, the fact that he was a Harvard professor of psychology and hooked up with Tim, Tim Leary. Um, and they were giving acid and psilocybin to students and faculty and clergy mm -hmm. and, and you know, anyone who would take it. And they were taking it with them. And they just had this incredible, like they really did. They were so central to like the psychedelic movement in the 70s and the hippie movement and all that stuff. They were such massive figures in that Tim Leary went on his own way and Ram Dass ended up in India um, where he met his guru. And he just, he just kept telling the stories of his time with his guru. That's one of the sort of main things he did. And every story is just filled with perfect lessons. Um, and, and the idea that like we're in a school, like take the curriculum, like the lessons are everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you learn how to tune into it and when you, you, when you do the work and you stay in the fire, like I mean, he's a perfect example of, of how high you can get. Um, I think the deepest, one of the biggest impacts that he had on me was around death um, and the, to the fragility of the body even. I mean, like he famously had a stroke um, and went from this really, you know, I mean, active, I mean, out there kind of dude to like losing his body and, and, and having to go through that, a, a death there. And he'd already been doing work with, in hospices with people that were dying. Um, so very clear um, instructions, like we're not our body. Um, and everything that's born, I mean, dies. Like it's just all these cycles, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so much of, if not all of our suffering comes from our denial or dismissal or fear of that, right? Um, I mean, and we can go on for hours again, dissecting how our modern culture um, is just setting us up for, for heartbreak. Like everyone, you know, there's nothing you can do to stave it off, like it's coming. And so he, he, he really improved my relationship to, to the, the reality I'm in and, and, and the inevitability of these things. And then when my, I mean, four or five years ago, I lost both my parents um, really quickly within sort of a year and a half of each other. Um, and um, it was, while it could have been devastating and maybe even should have been, even though I'm not supposed to say should, 
uh, what I recognized it as because of his teachings was the most grateful experience I've ever had. Um, my mom got sick. She went into the hospital one day. She never left the hospital. She left her body seven weeks later. Um, and, and she was relatively healthy. And I was able, she was in Kelowna, I was able to go there and spend probably six out of seven weeks at her bedside. Um, just going through this beautiful transition with her. And again, it was, I, was, I was blown away at how graceful it was. And I really owe that to him, I think. Um, and again, like as graceful as it was, it was fucking hard, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then I mean, for my dad to sort of, he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and for that, a pretty direct decline. Um, so to go through that, and I was going through a whole bunch of other stuff, like we we'll, we'll call it the dark night of my soul, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and right in the middle of it, or toward the end of it, really, I ended up in Maui um, at a yoga retreat with one of our teachers, Eddie Modestini. And I knew Eddie had been on Maui for like 30 years. And that's where Ram Das was. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I got there and, and Ryan taught me to be direct. So I went up to Eddie, I'm like, dude, I know, you, I know you've met him. I know you know him. I know he's a neighbor. Like, is there anybody, could you maybe get me to Ram Dass? Um, And he played it cool. He's like, oh, okay, I'll see, I'll see what I can do. And a couple of days later, he texted me to a good friend of his. He's like, we'll see if maybe she can get you in to see him. Turned out, um, Ram Dass's personal chef who hung out with him every day and was part of the family and kind of one of the gatekeepers. So she sort of talked to me on the phone to make sure I wasn't um, you know, I mean, I, I, gonna, gonna do anything inappropriate, I guess. Um, but we hit it off. And a few days later, um, it happened to be Guru Purnima, which is an Indian tradition, the day of honoring your gurus or your teachers. Oh. So it happened to be this day. And there was like a, a local satsang, a gathering of, of, of you know, community um, to pay respects to the guru in Ram Dass's living room. So I got invited to that. Um, so I mean, the eager, eager devotee I was, I was there like 45 minutes early and sort of walking around <laughs> and had this wonderful experience of the amazing place that he was. I was in there first, got right up at the front um, right up by the altar and at, like locals started piling in so the room was about maybe 30 people and the musicians came in and we started it's funny um, Ram Dass came in last and I saw him come in and I tried to be really sneaky with my phone and I got the video on and kind of turned it like under my arm at him um, and, and so it took a little bit of video look up pictures and I looked at it later on and I thought it was being sneaky, but the picture, like the video, he's looking right at the camera. Like he busted me like right away and he sort of gave me a little bit of a wink um, and sort of saw me. So like, you know, I mean, just really cool connection. Um, what was wonderful about it is it wasn't about him, like the, the Guru Purnima, the celebration. It was all about Neem Karoli Baba or Maharaji, um, his guru, which was, which was so cool to see the humility and the, um, where he was at, like by all means, like if anyone's going to be considered a, a great guru, it would be Ram Dass, right? But here he was celebrating his guru. So I thought that was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then um, the RT and, and so the closing ceremony of light, and, um, people started filing out. And I mean, there was no way like they were going to have to drag me from, from that spot. So I just sort of hung out. And loitered and checked out the room and slowly, slowly, slowly people were leaving. A few people lined up to talk to him and they had a couple minutes with him and then left. And I sort of got in the back of the line. So. And by the time I got up to him, um, everyone else was gone. And it was, it was I mean, his, his, his assistant was there, his, his, his partner and, and a couple of his nurses were hovering around and the chef was still there. So maybe before the people in the room and I just had him to all to myself. And so I sat, he invited me to sit beside him. Him and I sat there and just sort of shot the shit for 45, like 30, 45 minutes. We sort of sat there and, and traded stories and talked and um, the realest dude I ever met. 
right? Like just so, um, if anyone was justified in having a bit of an air around them, it would have been him, but he was just so cool and like looked like super connected to me, um, mm. really interested, um, heard the stories of what I was going through and was just super loving. And um, yeah, it was like meeting an old friend yeah. and just hanging out. It was really cool and yeah. had such a huge impact on me and, and, and was really important in my healing. Um, and so he, like, I walk with him. Uh, I walk with Ram Dass everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I, I, everyone's heard the quote and, and it's just everywhere I turn, it's just his, his guidance and his teachings and his inspiration. So those, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been so many other mm -hmm. figures and mentors, but those are the big ones. Yeah, and one big influence um, for Ramdas, and I believe yourself, is that has been the use of and the learnings gleaned from psychedelic medicines. Mm -hmm. What role have those had on your journey? And I feel this is a very important um, question because there's so much stigma around these. And for the people listening, I'm um, in finger quotes, drugs, mm -hmm. um, whereas everything is a drug, whether that be sugar or meat yeah. or uh, being on your phone, they all alter your consciousness. They all, all alter the, like the chemistry in your brain. Um, mm -hmm. It's how you use them. And so mm -hmm. let's talk about your journey with psychedelic medicines and how they played a role on your path to destigmatize um, the use, which is a great thing that's happening in, yeah. in today's world. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, um, I think you nailed it. Like there, I, I see way much more abuse of sugar and coffee and um, alcohol and sex and I mean all these other things. Yeah, um, internet I, I, video I, games. I, yeah, I, exactly. So I think, um, I mean, if, if people are scared of anything or the stigma around anything, it, it should be those things, not not this medicine. I mean, I grew up, I mean, pretty normal suburban middle-class kid um, who had, you know, I mean, marijuana and, and acid around and mushrooms around. And it was, it, it was done, rec like it was recreational, right? It was, it was um, partying and hanging out with friends and the weekend at the cottage. So it really wasn't um, medicine back then for me. It was just, I mean, and I had some wonderful experiences and I had some really shitty ones too, um, which I think, I mean, highlights the, the importance of set and setting with these things, like the, the intention you put into it, the space you're in, who you're with are really important, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone who's had a bad experience with any of this stuff, I think it's probably traceable to those kind of factors as opposed to the, the, the medicine itself, the plant itself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'd had those experiences, and I spoke about. I mentioned Oaxaca and San Jose del Pacifico um, before, and we were down in the city of Oaxaca. This is backpackers' route, and we're in a hostel, and this one European guy came in. I think it was maybe Spanish, and he was just glowing, like he was floating and glowing, and so clear and present and powerful. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I just came from this village up in the mountains where you go for your mushroom trip. He's like, y'all gotta go. And it wasn't on the itinerary, like I didn't even know about it. Um, so I went, we went, like I was the next stop. And I ended up spending three months, like it was gonna be like a couple nights. I was there for about three months. Um, and what I learned pretty quickly was that these plants were native to that land um, and had a deep, long, ancient history of being used as medicine um, for different things. I ended up really connecting with this one family in particular and the, the son who was about my age, a little bit older, who sort of took me in as a brother, his first experience with mushrooms um, he was eight years old, right? Yeah. So it's something that they do, I mean, as these rites of passage from a really young age and they have a respect for the plant and, it, and it, its messaging. 
um, that I've never seen anywhere. Um, you have to harvest it, like uh, I mean, even just the way they harvest it, um, and the, like just the, the reverence for it and their their gratitude for it as well. And it was just really funny. Like the it's a seemingly normal looking family, right? One thing, and grandma and grandpa, so the matriarch and patriarch. Um, when it was time for us to sort of have our our little journey with it, grandma let us into the kitchen. She opened up her fridge and pulled out this glowing jar of these beautiful bright plants suspended in honey. Um, it just looked like the nectar of the gods, really. Um, and so she prepared it for us and sent us off into the fort, like up, up we're on a mountain top. Um, so, I mean, the setting was perfect in this place. I understood, this is the first time I understood um, why people would think that heaven was in the clouds. Right? We think of heaven as up in the clouds. We were up on the mountain and every day the clouds would come up over. And so for a while we'd be in the clouds. You couldn't see anything. And then they would drop down the other side of the mountain and be laid out in front of you like you could walk out on them. It was, it was so stunning. I was like, okay, got it. That's heaven. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, every, you, you go through these forest trails and, and they open up until these like meadows of wild flowers. Um, there was a the family mascot was this old war horse of a pit bull um, who had no teeth left and would just gnaw on rocks all day long and just loved everybody. Um, so we, so she sent us up into these mountains, found the field and had our journey. And it was really different than um, my friend's basement in the middle of the night, already drunk and eating, I mean, like eating them out of a plastic bag. It was a very different experience. Yeah. Um, and one of the most beautiful things I've ever been through. And um, I, I, I turned into that guy that showed up at the hostel. We, we came back from this first journey and um, went into the cafe that this family had. They had a bunch of cabanas and a little, a little restaurant. We went in and ended up talking to everyone there and just blowing, like everyone's mind was just like, what have you just been through? And they're so inspired. And one of the people I was with was this um, Brazilian flight attendant who sort of came in and out of Mexico often and they would sort of take their little holidays. And so she actually sent um, a couple friends to find me to take them right back to the spot in the same way because the trip was so incredible. Yeah, it was just magic. Um, and it really showed me the, um, the possibility of this medicine, like what it can do for a heart and for a soul and for a spirit and for the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and when you approach it um, with respect and with gratitude and with, with clear intentions, how it can be this compressed evolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, to steal a term from Nikki Dome, um, that I think is really important. I think it uh, can, at, at, at the very least, can be a, like a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. I think it really does create these really powerful shifts and help us to take a, a big step forward when we need it or to, or to release something that's holding us back from that big step forward. Um, so really important for those kinds of things. I think, um, and Derek, you sound like you have more experience with it, um, using it as medicine to work with a condition. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, from my understanding, it, it's helped people with from a wide range of angles. Um, and even Ram, if we can have Ram Dass, you know, I mean, he was one of the kings of, of North American psychedelics, right? And his stories and his experience of it and um, connecting you to spirit and to your highest and your depth, I think is really important. I learned on that trip that I could get high without the substances. So I had a few of these little journeys mm -hmm. and um, the, this was before yoga too. Mm -hmm. And so, but the other, you mean the, the alcohol fell away and the, the other drugs, the, the drugs fell away. And I was, I was um, 
full and really grounded and powerful and clear. Um, and I credit, I credit the mushroom for that big shift. Um, and it was enough. I mean, like it, it was actually enough. Like I didn't need it. It showed me, it put me in that place and gave me this sustained experience of it that is with me now very clearly. Yeah. Um, so I think it rounds out our perception of reality mm. um, and shows us life from these other angles. And it just mm. gives us a fuller picture of what's going on and maybe gets us out of our limited separate ego mm. prison mm. that we end up in. Like, it's, I mean, the ego is important and, and we all got one and, and it's, it, there's a purpose, but we get stuck in there. Um, mm. And it can really bust you out of some of those tough corners, I think. Yeah, I'm a big proponent. I think the the modern movement um, of like microdosing. Um, there's a couple of companies that have reached out to me. Like uh, there's a company named Bloom um, that, that 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 is doing a wonderful job of of making this medicine available. Um, and so I think, yeah, it, it, before before we prescribe, you know, in some of these modern drugs for different mm -hmm. conditions, like let's 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 open people's hearts and, and connect them to soul and spirit. And I, the need for a lot of that stuff will, will disappear, I think. Yeah, I know, important, mm -hmm. important. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. So well said, Peter. Um, we've had so much wisdom shared with us through this conversation. And to close all these conversations, we asked the guests with the final three questions. And we've come to that point. And the first one is a big one. Well, they're really all pretty big questions. And this first one is through all, through it all, through all the highs and lows that is this journey, what has been the greatest life lesson that you've learned on your path so far that you feel called to share with us now? Yeah, I mean, we, we are one. Like we, I mean, there is so much division in the world crazy um and it's not getting better um not, not a, you know i mean in a lot of circles this idea that we're separate or that we're in danger from other that, that there is even other or that this i don't know i think it's really important for us to have these unitive experiences where we really are touched by the connection Right? It's just a, it's a network, and um, we go further together. Yeah. Right. I I and I don't win if you don't win. Mm. And I, I would say that to anybody that I meet, no matter where mm. they're at or what they believe or or or, or what they're trying to do. Um. There, and there's I don't think there's anything we can't accomplish. You know I. I can't even wrap my head around what would be going on if we all lived that way. Mm -hmm. And once you know that it's real and that's true, like that is truth, capital T, um, it's really hard to not live in service of that. So that's mm -hmm. sort of where I'm at. And, and yeah, so we are one. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a competition. This is a collaboration. Gosh, right? It's, um, it would be such a big shift in so many spaces. Yeah. Um, and so much of our suffering would disappear. It would disappear. Mm -hmm. So Peter, in three words, how would you describe the experience you were having on this earth? Love. Love has got to be, I mean, at, as far as words go, there aren't many higher and more important. Um, support, I think, is, is, has been a big part of my life. Um, being supported by I mean, ancient, ancient, capital A, like, um, I'm, I'm clearly being held up and propelled forward by so many giants. Um, 
And I mean, that's what I'm trying to do for others as well, right? That was just like from both ends. Like I'm, 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 I'm receiving and being supported and that's what I think my, my highest mission to love and support. And I mean, I wanted, I, must, I want to say family has been a big, um, big, like there's so much for me to learn. Like uh, my family history and the pathways are, are pretty broken and pretty, pretty, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of strange corners um, and, and there's so much for me to learn from that. And then my, my current experience of, of being, being a family, like having this, this, these dependents and these partnerships and these, it's really interesting. But I want to replace um, family maybe with relationship. Like it's really, yeah. um, this was a, a word shared. I was blessed with some, some wonderful First Nations elder teachings recently. Um, and, and they talked a lot about relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the most important ones maybe with myself, but then with my children, my, my partner, my family, and the community. And the, so, yeah, love and support and relationships and family. Let's pick forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we've examined the past. We did a rewind and just kind of take a look back on your journey, but let's, let's use some magic and we'll fast forward. We'll fast forward into the future. I'm going to fast mm -hmm. forward into the future and we're going to be sitting alongside an 85 year old Peter Elmas. Who is that mm -hmm. man? Where are you? Who are you surrounded by? What are you doing? And what are the, is the legacy that you have left behind? Okay. So you're gonna be sitting with, I mean, I imagine it, and that's what, that's 45 years from now. Um, I mean, hopefully so I'll have some little grandkids running around, right? Like family is, is key. Um, Sass will be right there with me um, and the kids and their kids and um, my sister and my brother and you know, my nieces and nephews and all those things. Like there's, I mean, there's gonna be some wonderful relationships around me, um, lots of love. I will still identify as a yoga student. I mean, hopefully by then I will be able to consider myself a senior student. Right? <laughs> um, and I most certainly will be teaching. Um, I don't know what that will look like. Like I, I mean, no, I do. I mean, this, this, this technology is pretty, pretty clear. Right, and it works, it's pretty effective. I will be teaching movement within breath, yamas, niyamas, um, you know, I mean, stillness and steadiness and helping people vitalize themselves and, and train the mind and have these unitive experiences of, of oneness. Yeah, I, I will be still facilitating that work. Um, and so, I mean, maybe the legacy will be um, that those that I've walked with um, and helped to guide and learned from are paying it on. So the legacy would be maybe um, a really clear, big network um, from my work with one. I mean, if it's not pretty clear, I mean, I put it on my chest, like I'm, I'm a lion for life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I see the one yoga family, um, far and wide and, um, yeah, yeah, a gray, long gray beard mm -hmm. and a, and a, and a long healthy spine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's just sit with this 85 year old Peter for one moment longer. And I just want you to take a few breaths with him. And I want you to feel, feel him in your heart because I'm not going to leave us in the future. All the beauty is in the now. And I'm going to bring us back to the infinite abundant now. And in this infinite abundant now, that 85 year old Peter, he sends you a message. What does he whisper in your heart? I love you. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Let me walk with you. 
Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Well, I love you. <laughs> Keep going. Let me walk with you, Peter. Yeah, buddy. And it's all, been... the way, all the way home. Mm-hmm. All the way home. We're here. It's been such an honor. It's been a pleasure. For anyone wanting to connect with you, they could find you on Instagram at Peter, Peter Elmas. Um, they can find you teaching yoga at oneyoga.ca. Anywhere else we could send them, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, Instagram's a great point. I'm on there, I'm contact on there. And um, the classes um, through One Yoga, the digital platform. Um, One Yoga North Band, I do a couple classes here that are a bit smaller um, in person stuff. So yeah, just reach out. Um, and and we'll connect yeah there's going to be some one yoga trainings next year um that i expect both of you to be a part of so we'll be doing mm-hmm. some some uh, we used to call them teacher trainings but we're going to change that up a little bit and disrupt that flow and just call it yogi training so we'll be doing a bunch mm-hmm. of that stuff so if you're interested I, look, I am i am and i look forward to those and learning more let's bring our fists together in unity to close this conversation welcome to the winner circle a choice yeah, well, that we could all make boom amazing yeah thank you both so grateful thank you it's been such a pleasure to get to know you to listen to your story and all the wisdom you shared and just thank you for sharing yourself with us and with the listeners it's such a gift mm-hmm. you're welcome thank you yeah and that's and thank you and that's a wrap on today's conversation see you next time